now, listen to this, the FCC right now, under its current leadership, is considering new rules, once again, to loosen the, the remaining media ownership rules we have that aren't very uh, uh, strict, the number of outlets that you can own. And this was a huge surprise to me. Now, I expected that when Chairman Powell was a chairman in the first, uh, first uh, Bush administration. I expected it with uh, Kevin Martin. And they both pushed through uh, laws that were later turned back by the Congress and the courts. I didn't expect that to happen after the 2008 election. I thought when the new chairman came, whoopee, we got the third vote now. All we had to do was count to three, I thought. And I could get uh, all of these things we were talking about today, some put the brakes on consolidation, reassert the public interest, do something on diversity, do something about broadband, net neutrality, the open uh, internet, uh, and, and all that. But as far as media goes, the media policy, nothing happened. Nothing changed. And it's going down. Basically, the, basically the rules that Chairman Janikowski put uh, before the commission uh, last winter um, eerily reminiscent of what uh, Kevin Martin put from terms of newspaper broadcast cross ownership so you can own the newspaper and own the broadcast stations and all of that uh, in, the, in, in your district. And the commission was on the verge of approving this just this past December, just a few months ago. But thanks to uh, a really effective coalition of civil rights group and public interest groups, Common Cause, certainly among them, and Free Press, and Leadership Council on Civil Rights, and a whole bunch of other uh, groups and, and minority groups, uh, and 200,000 people who responded on the internet say, immediately to a, to a plea, uh, the chairman decided that, well, maybe he'd hold that and do another little study or something until he was out of, uh, out of the commission. So uh, at least uh, it's on hold for a few months. Uh, where it goes when a new chairman comes to town, uh, we will have to see what that new chairman decides to do, and we'll have to see what kind of a chairman or chairwoman the president would like to have in his second term. And this is this was this is what was so surprising to me after the election that we would even be considering a move to loosen those media ownership rules because when he was a senator. And when he was a candidate for president, Barack Obama voiced pretty strong opposition to loosening those rules. And I still have copies. I made a copy of the file when I left the EC, a file full of letters, a file folder full of letters from Senator Obama, some just from him, some uh, one with uh, Senator Durbin from Illinois, one with uh, John Kerry, now Secretary of State. And those others said very clearly, you should not be considering at the FCC loosening these media ownership rules until you understand the effects on diversity groups and on minorities and the public interest. And the first thing you'll be doing down there is conduct a proceeding to see how communities are presently being served and how the public is being served. So we're calling on him now, and we have, uh, we have a program uh, called Promises to Keep at, at Common Cause. You can learn about it on our website and, and sign up uh, and help. Uh, saying, you know, this, this was the pledges that were made. This is the second term. When you give us a new FCC, or nominate a new FCC chairperson, hearken back to what you said back in 2006 and 2007 and 2008. So I don't know that how much effect that's going to have, but I know it will gain more attention the more people who are involved in it and expressing, uh, uh, expressing an opinion like that. The president has a chance now to do something if he would only take advantage of it. By the way, the FCC also has under consideration right now petitions from big telecom. Although it's hard to t differentiate now a telecom company from a media company, but the big telephone folks like uh, AT&T and, and all of those, to eliminate all the public interest obligations over our broadband infrastructure. And what they basically want, it's pretty clear what they want. I mean, they want monopoly control without regulation. What corporations have always wanted, 
what corporations will always want. And that's not going to change. That's in the drinking water of capitalism, I guess. But what has to change is how the public sector reacts to that and what kind of controls and discipline and limitations you put into the system. Which brings us again back for just a couple of minutes to the, uh, to the internet itself because I want to complete that talk because a lot of people will say, uh, you know, well, that cops guy looks pretty old and he's talking a lot about television and radio and cable and doesn't he know it's the uh, internet age right now and isn't new media going to save us all and be the open dynamic opportunity creating platform that, uh, uh, that it is is bound uh, to be, why even worry about those, uh, uh, those other relics? And we do see wonderful innovation and experimentation and entrepreneurship uh, on the internet. Barriers to entry are low. Everyone can speak. I guess everybody can be heard, but everybody can, can speak and news can be flashed around the world in a, in a millisecond. It's all wonderful and all true. But history shows us that just about every communications system travels down a similar road toward consolidation and gatekeeper control. Happened with, happened with the movies, happened with television, happened with radio, cable. You can read Tim Wu's wonderful book on this called The Master Switch. Several of you here have no doubt, uh, uh, have no doubt, uh, read that. But we can see that happening now and people are starting to actually understand that what we were warning about in theory is happening in practice when they see gatekeeper control on the, on the internet, when they see consolidation on the internet, when they see a few large companies controlling first access to the internet and now the internet itself. You know, if we, if we deny broadband its potential, its huge potential, probably greater potential than any communications innovation since the printing press, maybe more than that, just to, to open new worlds and to help us uh, inform ourselves and care for ourselves and educate ourselves. And if we let that technology fall victim to this well-traveled road of consolidation or the always present phenomenon of toll booths and gatekeepers. We will have done that technology a horrible disservice. We will have done ourselves and our country and ourselves as citizens a horrible disservice. And I don't think history would ever, would ever forgive us. All of this that I'm talking about seriously affects our news and information uh, uh, infrastructure. The, the, the ills of traditional media and the ills of new media are not separate problems. You shouldn't look at this as, is this, this new media versus traditional media, the new versus the old. We've got one media ecosystem in this country, one news and information infrastructure. And it needs tremendous repair in the traditional section sector, and it needs some really creative thinking and some national dialogue about what is the public interest with regard to media and journalism and all the rest on the new media and we are not having that discussion right now. But it really is one ecosystem. You know, most of the news that you read, even on the internet, still comes from where? It still comes from the newspaper newsroom and the broadcast newsroom. It's just that there's so much less of it. And that's where we need some creative thinking. Now with that, I want to get the discussion going here, but the, there's one other subject I want to mention, and it may sound initially like a digression, but it's not because it's just another facet of the influence of big money and big power on our media, in our media and how that distorts democracy and we suggest some way that we might do something about it. I think it's safe to say that everybody in this room got sick and tired of watching all of those anonymous political advertisements brought to you by various PACs and super PACs and corporations and all these other things that creative uh, political strategists uh, uh, came up with. Probably a majority of that six to ten billion dollars that was raised in the 2012 election cycle ended up going where? 
to media to those ads, right, six to ten billion dollars. But how many of those ads really told you who was sponsoring them? Who was bringing you that ad? Oh, you'd see something like this ad brought to you by Citizens for Purple Mountain Majesties and Amber Ways of Grain or <laughs> Committee for Mom and Apple Pie and all the rest. But that's, uh, that's about all you would know. And you might not know that that Purple Mountain Majesties ad was brought to you by a chemical company that was dumping sludge into the ocean or into the Chesapeake Bay over near where, where I live. Uh, we just don't know. They don't want us to know because it might make a difference in how we cast our votes. And I think you're living through all of this and have lived through it with, with regard to your mayoral race uh, here. I'm told that uh, you know a lot of super PACs involved in that to the tune of millions of dollars and even the school board race resulting in a ton of uh, uh, high spending uh, ads and again how do you know who's sponsoring that wonderful Kids Are Beautiful ad? Isn't somebody who's really opposed to public education in the first place? You don't. The infamous uh, Citizens United Supreme Court decision, as most of you know, opened the doors to all kinds of cute ways to inject money into the uh, political system. Yet Congress refuses still to require full disclosure, and Congress is not, I think, going to pass a full disclosure bill anytime soon. But did you know that an agency of government, specifically the Federal Communications Commission, has the authority right now to do something about that? And it does under Section 317 of the Telecommunications Act. In fact, this provision goes back to the 1920s before there was even a telecom act. Still on the books called sponsorship identification, which means if a station gets compensation for running a commercial ad or a political ad, you have to disclose who's sponsoring that. Now, the FCC last revisited Section 317, I think, back in the 60s. Uh, they concluded that people had a right to know by whom they were trying to be persuaded, but they haven't updated the rule since then. And it needs updating because now we have all these new PACs and super PACs and dark avenues for dark money and all that. The commission could do that in like 90 to 120 days. Revise that rule currently on the books. You don't have to wait for Congress to pass a bill. You don't have to wait for the President of the United States to propose a bill. They could do it right now with three votes. And it's getting some attention. It got some attention in the House recently. The Government Accountability Office uh, pointed out that uh, sponsorship identification ads hadn't been updated in years, over half a century, and they urged the FCC to do it. A couple of weeks after that, the entire FCC was testifying before the United States Commerce Committee, Senator Rockefeller, uh, chairman of it, and Senator Bill Nelson from Florida brought this subject up, and he asked the commissioners what they were going to do about it, and a couple of them, including the chairman, kind of weaseled around and gave a little non kind of answer to it. Very unusually, the chairman of the committee interrupted Senator Nelson, who's asking these questions, and he said to the commissioners, He didn't ask you a complex question. Give him an answer. Are you going to do this or aren't you going to do it? So it's got some attention. And here we have, again, at, at Common Cause, a, a Your Right to Know campaign, uh, Transparency uh, in Government to really get a movement going to urge the Federal Communications Commission to implement Section 317 of the law. And I hope some of you will, I uh, hope all of you will, uh, will take a look at that. It's not going to solve the problem of money in politics. Don't get me wrong. But at least it's a reform. At least we'd have some disclosure. And it, it, it would be good unto itself, but would also show that you can still have reform. You can still make steps towards democracy. So as, as I conclude, let me just emphasize how high the stakes are for these media issues. You know, we've got a lot of problems as a country right now. We've got too many people out of work. We've got a country that's not competing globally like it used to. We've got the outrageous influence of big money in politics. We've got 50 million people without health insurance, we've got challenged schools, we've got energy dependence, we've got the degradation of the climate, 
uh, doors of opportunity still closed to so many Americans, and that list goes on. But what I'm here to say is not, not, not one of those issues, not one, is going to be resolved until we have a media that really brings those issues to the attention of the American people, digs for facts, tells the story, tells the truth, and encourages that kind of discussion in our country so voters can make intelligent decisions. There's no get out of, uh, get out of the whole free card in, in, in this game where America's in a deep hole. Uh, and it's not on autopilot that it's going to get out of that uh, hole. It's going to really take an informed citizen. That's the prerequisite of self-government, the prerequisite of democracy. That's what groups like the LA Media Reform Group and others are doing, trying to keep that flame of the public interest uh, uh, alive. I remain an optimist. Some people say, well, how do you do that? You know, what are, what are the great victories that you've won at the uh, FCC on media? And that's kind of a short list. We stopped some bad things from happening, but not, uh, not very successful in really getting this reassertion of the public interest that I talked about. And there are arsenals of dollars on the other side, huge power of the special interests uh, on the other side. But that's always been a challenge to, uh, to reform in, the, in this country, and that's why I'm working now at the grassroots and working with Common Cause to try to get folks mobilized. And that's why I've joined with Free Press and Public Knowledge in addition to Common Cause and all the civil rights groups. Get a coalition together. It's a game of addition. It's a game of grassroots power. We did this back in 2003, even before the age of the uh, uh, Internet, uh, when Michael Powell rammed through those rules to loosen media ownership, and they thought it was an inside the beltway deal, they didn't have to take it to the country, but my fellow colleague, Jonathan Alstein, and I said, no, that's not right. We need to take this issue across America. Working with Common Cause, free press, senators and congressmen, we thought like we did. Three million people, this was before the internet really got rolling, three million people wrote to the FCC and wrote to Congress and said, we don't like those rules. They'd already been passed by the commission. But then the Senate voted twice to overturn those decisions. The House voted a little different line to overturn them before they could bring those measures together. The Third Circuit Court reversed the rules and sent them back to the commission where they, where they still are today. But senators and congressmen came to me after that and said, you know what? I went home to a town hall meeting, a meeting like this, room full of people, and people were asking questions about Media ownership, he said, nobody ever asked me a question about media ownership before. But you ask those questions and what happened, they came back to Washington and voted to overturn the bad rule. So people can still make a difference, and that's where real reform comes from. That's always been the story of reform. If it's civil rights, or women's rights, or labor rights, or disability rights, or LGBT rights, that's where it comes from. It comes not a gift from Washington to the people, comes from the demand of the people, from you and from local citizens who have had enough. And this is reform whose time has come. So what can you do? A friend back there said today, what's, what's the program? Well, you can look at the program on, on our website, but it's, it starts out, there's no silver bullet. I'm, I don't have any magic formula. You talk to your family. You talk to your friends. You talk to everybody you know about the importance of these issues. You contact your community leaders. You go to that town hall meeting when your congressperson or your senator is home. You write your stations and tell them what you think. You encourage local media, alternative media, community media, low power media. That's all part of, uh, part of the solution. You tell the FCC to put the brakes on media consolidation. You tell the FCC it's time to reassert the public interest in the decisions that it makes. It's time to do something about diversity. Make sure we keep that internet open. There's lots of things we need to do. And they're not disjointed. They're all part of these problems of the media ecosystem that we have out there that is so essential for democracy. And you can work with groups like Common Cause. Visit our website, our free press, or other organizations of, uh, of, of your choice and see what they've got going. I'm trying to get all of these groups as coordinated as we possibly can in Washington so as that grassroots pressure 
builds up, and I do see some signs of that uh, happening. Uh, once it gets to Washington, then we can have a strategy and a sense of priorities about what we're going to do and some tactics for how to do it. But I think some of these things are coming home to the American people now. For a while, it was just reformers saying, this is what's going to happen. But now they're seeing it happen. Now they're seeing how much they're paying for new media, for broadband. They're seeing the violations of the open internet. No, they can't unlock their cell phones. Sorry, the big companies aren't going to let you do that. Cable rates keep going up. All of this trend toward consolidation. So people are, and I can sense this in Denver, people are really, I think, beginning to feel this, and that's kind of the sustenance for a grassroots, uh, uh, a grassroots movement. So, you know, Bob Edgar had a uh, favorite saying that, uh, that he used when he was trying to explain to us how we all have to work together, work at the grassroots, pull together for a common cause, which is need, what we need to do here. He says, if you, if you want to walk fast, walk alone. If you want to walk far, walk together. So let's walk this together.